Bright, transient, and majestic, humanity has long been inspired by the moon. She's been a focus of myth, a guide for explorers and abuse of poets. As children, many of us have pondered her pock surface and imagined faces or omens. But have you ever been so enamored by the moon that you just wanted to, you know, blow it up? Well, if you did, you might fit right in at the US Air Force. It just happened that in the 1950s, enough Air Force officials and scientists were interested in shooting a nuclear warhead at the moon that an entire top secret plan was developed. Project A-119. Though the US government has never officially acknowledged its existence, documents and testimonies regarding the project have begun leaking since the turn of the century, implicating some big names, not to mention some crazy engineering and physics. On October the 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union took a major lead in the space race by launching Sputnik 1, the first man-made satellite put into orbit. This led to what has become known as the Sputnik Crisis. The American public was considerably discouraged by the USSR's major technological achievements, and not just because it symbolized their lead in aerospace science. Rather, Sputnik meant that the United States was suddenly vulnerable to Russian missile attacks. At the time, US plans to launch their own satellite used a rocket with 150,000 pounds or 670,000 newtons of thrust, meaning the satellite could only weigh about 21.5 pounds under 10 kilograms. Yet Sputnik weighed more than eight times as much, at a whopping 184 pounds or 83 kilograms, meaning the Soviet R-7 rocket that launched it into orbit produced a million pounds or 4.4 million newtons of thrust. If the USSR could produce a rocket this powerful, it meant they could make ICBMs that could likely reach American soil. Americans were anxious and demoralized, which was only made worse by the US Navy's Project Vanguard, which had two failed attempts to launch a smaller American satellite soon after. Now, most people know that the United States did eventually launch their own satellite, Explorer 1, and had the last word in the space race after Apollo 11 put men on the moon. But what many don't know is how many other eccentric ideas floated about the US government and military to reassure the American public in the short term. Project A119 was just one of these. Research began in May 1958 through the Armour Research Foundation, or ARF, at the Illinois Institute of Technology and was led by the US Air Force. The ARF had already been studying the effects of nuclear explosions since 1949, so it was easy to shift to studying their effects on the lunar environment specifically. They were inspired by rumors in American newspapers that the Soviet Union was planning to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution, which happened to coincide with a lunar eclipse on the 7th of November. November 1957. Such a plan did exist, but documents discovered thus far only date the plans from 1958. Either way, no bomb went off on the 7th of November, so the US government believed that if they could set off an explosion of their own, it would show a technological advantage and raise the public's morale. ARF's team at the Illinois Institute of Technology was led by Leonard Riefel, who was adamant that the rate of the US Air Force's development of ICBMs would make the project feasible by 1959. If they addressed certain issues, Rifle believed they could hit a target on the surface of the moon with an accuracy of under two miles. The first issue was the size of the bomb. The team originally wanted to detonate a full hydrogen bomb, but the US Air Force rejected this idea since it would require a payload too heavy for the rocket. Instead, the team settled on a W-25 warhead, a small bomb only based on nuclear fission, unlike the fusion of the hydrogen bomb. Weighing only 220 pounds or 100 kilograms, the W-25 had a yield of just 1.7 kilotons, a mere 10% of the Little Boy atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, and just 0.01% of Castle Bravo, the United States' most powerful hydrogen bomb at the time, and indeed to this day with a yield of 15 megatons. As you might imagine, this meant that the W-25 explosion would be much harder to see than the massive burst of light from the hydrogen bomb that was originally envisioned. As a result, ARF decided that they'd have to detonate the bomb along the moon's terminator, the dividing line of twilight between the light of the sun and the darkness of the moon's shadow. This would make the light of the explosion the most visible, while simultaneously allowing direct sunlight to reflect off the resulting dust cloud, making that visible as well. 
the first glance, all of this seemed simple enough, and you might think that if the US government could detonate so many bombs in the desert and on Pacific Islands, what would the problem be with detonating one on a dead space rock hundreds of thousands of miles away? Well, there are actually quite a few reasons. For one thing, the research team feared it would interfere with future scientific investigation. For instance, it would cause problems for measuring the moon's natural background radiation. More importantly, the US already had long-term plans for manned lunar exploration and even colonization, and they worried about the danger fallout would pose for other explorers. Again, you might wonder why they treated the entire lunar surface with more deference than New Mexico or the Bikini Atoll, but unfortunately, none of the leaked documents explained that rationale. However, by far the biggest concern was, well, missing. Keep in mind that in 1958, no man-made object had yet reached the moon. The first was the Soviet Lunar 2 mission in September 1959. It wasn't a given that the scientists could aim the rocket well enough over such a long range, and there was a slight fear that it could miss the moon but come close enough to wrap back around and shoot back to Earth. A more probable scenario was that the rocket would fail to leave the atmosphere or Earth's orbit altogether, which would be a major risk if it fell back down and landed in a populated area. As a result of these concerns, as well as the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty signed in 1963 and the Outer Space Treaty signed in 1967, not to mention arguably more spectacular feats like landing men on the moon, the Air Force eventually abandoned Project A119, just as the Soviets did with their similar Project E4. However, it's difficult to say exactly when it was cancelled due to the lack of documents and facts that have come to light or been released. Now, the public was totally unaware of Project A119 at the time, and they remained in the dark until 1999, when writer Key Davidson discovered two scientific papers related to it. Possible contribution of lunar nuclear weapons detonations to the solution of some problems in planetary astronomy, and radiological contamination of the moon by nuclear weapons detonations. These papers were listed on a 1959 application for an academic scholarship at the Miller Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, by none other than famous astronomer and science educator Carl Sagan, who had died in 1996. In his application, Sagan discussed Project A119 and his contributions to its goals and research. He had apparently joined the team as a doctoral student under his advisor, astronomer Gerhard Kuiper, and uh, was primarily tasked with uh, researching the potential expansion of the nuclear explosion's resulting dust cloud, an essential part of making the detonation easily visible to the American people to boost morale. Davison published his findings in his biography, Carl Sagan, A Life, which was followed by a review in Nature that went into detail regarding the these two papers and Project A119. It also reiterated Davidson's speculation that Sagan's inclusion of this information in his application constituted a breach of national security and the project confidentiality. With the story spreading fast, Leonard Rifle, head of the ARF research team at the Illinois Institute of Technology, broke the silence to speak to the media and confirm the existence of the project. He also revealed that the team had been aware of Sagan's leaking of project details in his application and that they did indeed consider it a breach of confidentiality, though nothing ever came of it. Rifle's comments caused quite a stir and prompted a request via the Freedom of Information Act for documents regarding the project. The Illinois Institute of Technology consequently released a study of lunar research flights, Volume 1, now credited to Rifle, but revealed that most other documents had been destroyed during the 1980s. The US government also refused to confirm the existence of Project A119, a stance that they maintain to this day. When Leonard Rifle revealed the details of Project A119, he wasn't exactly full of praise. In fact, he said he was horrified that such a gesture to sway public opinion was ever considered. 73 years old at the time, Rifle claimed that he had tried to dissuade the Air Force officials that had hired him. I made it clear at the time there would be a huge cost to science of destroying a pristine lunar environment. He went on to say that he feared the explosion's resulting crater would have ruined the man in the moon that we all know so well. Plus, if it had indeed coincided with the Soviet Project E4, it likely would have led to a militarization of space and a race to achieve military rather than scientific dominance on the moon. With the project now public knowledge, if unofficially, many public figures and academics also offered their condemnation. For example, David Lowry, a British environmental consultant and anti-nuclear activist, called the project obscene. To quote him, to think that the first contact human beings would have had with another world would have been to explode a nuclear bomb had they gone ahead, uh, we would never have had the romantic image of Neil Armstrong taking one giant step for mankind. 
However, Lowry also stated his doubts that A119 was truly a relic of the space race. He also said, The US has always wanted to militarize space, and some of the fanciful ideas currently being put forward will seem as incredible as the idea of nuking the moon in the 50s seems today. Although he didn't provide any details of ideas currently being put forward, it is plausible that nuclear explosions on the moon could be in the future, or that major nuclear and military powers are already considering them as plans for lunar exploration and colonization. That's because while the original Project A119 was solely focused on swaying public opinion and improving morale, a more open-minded approach could likely find scientific uses for a nuclear explosion on the moon. Most notably, small nuclear detonations lacking the requirement for visibility from Earth could be used to study both the geological composition of the lunar surface as well as the effects of nuclear explosions and radiation on the moon. In fact, such studies have already been proposed by Edward Teller, the physicist credited with the development of the hydrogen bomb in 1957 prior to the inception of Project A119. The findings could inform plans to establish manned bases on the moon powered by nuclear reactors, such as those envisioned under NASA's Artemis program, which uh, we've made a whole video on, by the way. In other words, even though the space race was never punctuated with the awe and or horror of looking up to see a mushroom cloud rising from the face of the moon, the work of Project A119 and the scientists involved like Carl Sagan and Leonard Reifel might not have been totally for nothing. Who knows? The first nuclear explosion on the moon might not be a rocket from Earth at all, but something detonated by explorers on the lunar surface itself.